Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is uh, our first repeat guest, Katie Waldman. Uh, Katie, could you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I am the words correspondent for Slate Magazine, and I'm glad to be here. Well, thanks so much for coming on again. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Go Set a Watchman, which is the old, new, uh, Harper Lee kind of semi-novel that uh, came out last week and uh, apparently sold 1 million copies in its first week, which, which is pretty incredible. And we had a previous conversation on Blogging Heads uh, when News First broke about uh, the publication of this of this book. And uh, we disagreed about whether or not it, it should be published, um, with you taking the position that uh, we should probably wait until after Harper Lee passes away before we, we publish this book. So. So uh, you have read the book, and I have not. Yeah. Um, so how has uh, uh, has your opinion changed at all on this question about whether this book, uh, Go, Go Set a Watchman, should have been published? Um, not really. I have to say I'm grateful for the opportunity to read this prequel sequel. Um, I think it was a fascinating literary artifact. Um, definitely not something that equals To Kill a Mockingbird, though it has its own lessons to teach. Um, but I can't say I'm persuaded that the ethics of releasing it um, have changed or that the story coming out of the Harper Lee Industrial Complex, um, you know, rings true to me. They have definitely doubled down on the idea that she enthusiastically wants this to happen. Um, and I'm still not persuaded, although I wish and I hope that, the, that that's the case. Right. And, and we were talking earlier that there was a photos released or there was some kind of event where Harper Lee was presented with a copy of of the book, but you uh, thought maybe that, that this seemed a little fishy. Yeah, I mean, it was just one of those very um, polished um, products where you did not get actual video footage of Harper Lee receiving the book. There were stills of her smiling at this big table surrounded by publishing friends. There was some audio of her um, thanking her agent and thanking her lawyer. Um, but I mean, it did seem like a very produced and performed uh, piece of documentary filmmaking and I wasn't sure what to make of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you may be a, a, a ghost at a Washington truther. I may be. <laughs> I hate being described as a truther in any way, but I, I will cop to that description. Right, and, and and the story has changed since we talked the first time. There's been reporting in the New York Times uh, about how the lawyer changed her story about when she first encountered the manuscript. So it's it's definitely gotten kind of fishier and fishier um, mm -hmm. since then. But but the book is out and is is selling wildly. And um, you wrote a really interesting review of it for Slate. And I guess the first thing I want to talk about was uh, the issue that. Uh, Michiko Kakatani raised in her review, which was barely even a review of the book. It was kind of like a breaking news story. Mm -hmm. I think that the New York, yeah. New York Times even did like a breaking news alert. Um, yeah, with, yeah, with, it's with crazy headline. how we've been viewed these characters. Yeah, yeah, which is which is pretty bizarre. And so her, her review talked about how um, in, Go in Ghost of the Watchmen, the, Ad the Atticus character is racist. Uh, so can you talk mm -hmm. about how Atticus is portrayed in the and go to watchman. Yeah, I think the first thing that I would mention or say about Atticus's character is there are real notes of continuity um, between the Atticus of To Kill a Mo Mockingbird and the Atticus of Go Set a Watchman. Um, he's still this sort of stable, wise, compassionate, and stoic voice. He is presented as the moral center, actually in an uncomplicated way for most or much of um, Go Set a Watchman as well as To Kill a Mockingbird. It's just that sort of about a third of the way into the book, um, that easy vision of him starts to unravel and you see that he sympathizes with the Ku Klux Klan, that he has um, chaired various white citizens council meetings. Um, this is kind of the more respectable and law abiding version of the Klan. Uh -huh. um, he disagrees with the NAACP about integration. Um, and so he has all these unsavory political views, but at the same time in his personal relationships, especially with his daughter, he comes across as kind of a shining moral example. And so really the conflict that Jean Louise has to face is how can this man contain such contradictions and be both the Atticus of Mockingbird and this new disturbing Atticus. 
Right. And so is, is this kind of the central like conflict of the novel is revolves around Atticus's uh, Jean Louise discovering that Atticus is a racist? Yeah, I would say so. And it's definitely, it's a different type of coming of age story um, for Jean Louise in the first, in, I don't know whether to call it like the sequel or the prequel, but in To Kill a Mockingbird, um, she has this, this narrative of lost innocence and of disenchantment that has to do with realizing that the community in which she's embedded and that she loves so much has these really terrible ethical flaws. And here, um, it's the same kind of loss of innocence, but it's actually just a, a question of character and the personality of this one figure in her life. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually the trajectory of it is not quite, is, is not as different from To Kill a Mockingbird as I think a lot of the reviews have implied. It's just like where the disillusionment comes in. Is it with this person or is it with a broader society? Yeah, that's an interesting contrast that you wrote about in, in your review. I mean, which do you think is, is a more effective uh, way of, of showing this kind of loss of innocence? Was it, is it through the personal relationship or is it through the kind of loss of faith in, in the society? I think that's a really interesting question because what To Kill a Mockingbird did is it took the society one and just did it better. So I can imagine a version of Ghost of Wa Ghost Set of Watchmen that tackles um, the sort of personal disillusionment with the same grace and force and immediacy that Mockingbird did, and that would be an equally wonderful novel. I think that this doesn't quite get there. Watchmen doesn't quite get there. Um, in terms of what is more valuable, um, I guess it really depends on whether you believe that social issues should be addressed at the structural level um, as a kind of emergent property of our relationships and our societal um, conventions, uh -huh. or whether you think that social injustice is rooted in sort of like the tangled, um, you know, marsh of character, um, and that's where we really should be focusing our energies. I think there's evidence for both views, uh -huh. and probably a, a complete picture would take them both into account. Uh -huh. Well, I guess we, we, we have them both now in two separate novels. I mean, I think it is interesting, interesting, mm -hmm. like the theme of how to deal with a bigoted relative is something mm -hmm. that I can't think of another book that where that's a major theme. And it does seem yeah. like um, something that people have to deal with in real life. And today, it'd probably be something along the lines of, um, you know, bigotry towards uh, uh, gays and lesbians or something like that. And I mean, obviously, there's still racism. Um, but you know how when someone you love has uh abhorrent views you know what do you do there's no there's no easy answer to that and, and so what so what is the i mean this is i guess kind of a spoiler <laughs> um like how does where, where does lee end up in in the relationship between the scout character and and atticus after his bigotry has been discovered I think you're getting to the heart of, or that question in answering it, I think I will get to the heart of my own um, deep ambivalence about this book, which is that the message of Go Set a Watchman ends up saying it, it's the same sort of reconciliation and empathy message that you get from Mockingbird. And it says, despite these toxic views about race. He's your father. Jean Louise has this kind of reckoning of the soul where she realizes I must accept him and love him despite these views. And what matters is the kind of the local and the personal connection between characters. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful and beautiful impulse, that sentiment that, you know, harmony above all, that's with that in, an understanding and tolerance. But at the same time, I almost wish that this had been a book that addressed those themes through the lens of homosexuality, for instance, as opposed to racism, just because the way that the argument plays out, you know, the family needs to be knit back together, kind of um, disturbingly echoed the lost cause narrative of the Civil War. Uh -huh. Like we have this family, this national family that's been ruptured because of an ideological difference of opinion. Um, and what we should do is put that aside as secondary and knit back 
together these social ties. And the fact is that's not the way Reconstruction or, or the wake of the Civil War should have been handled. This was a really festering, terrible issue and minds needed to be changed. More effort needed to be put in that direction. It wasn't just about um, you know, uh, restoring the social fabric to what it was. And so there was a kind of apology for the Confederacy, I think, embedded in uh, the theme of Ghosts at a Watchman, even as Ghosts at a Watchman was addressing these themes on a much uh, smaller, more familial, particular level. Yeah, and you. I'm you, not sure if that makes sense to you. <laughs> yeah, you highlighted no, in your, it's kind in your of a review. Convoluted. You highlighted in your review this this theme, and uh, there's one line that I found really striking. Um, so this is a character who's talking about. Um, I think the pre-Civil War South, and he says, it's a society high, highly paradoxical with alarming inequities, but with the private honor of thousands of persons winking like like lightning bugs through the night. So that's really beautiful. But then you realize like, oh, he's talking about, you know, racists. And he's talking about people who are supporting slavery. Um, yeah. And it, I mean, it's, I don't want to come down too hard on like, if someone has a viewpoint that you disagree with, you must shut them out of the conversation. You must cut them out of your life. Um, I think that Harper Lee is writing in a time where the country was bifurcated, where she wanted to see people come together as opposed to, you know, being completely split, up, split apart. But in echoing that message of reconciliation that, you know, people with perhaps less peer motives were also promoting. Um, she, I think, um, might have given ammunition to racist people in the South who wanted to just drown out the legacy of slavery and pretend that it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. um... So uh, Adam Gobnick had an interesting piece on this, and which we'll link to, and I'll just want to briefly read something that he wrote. Um, mm -hmm. So he says, the, the idea that Atticus in this book, quote, becomes the bigot, he was not in Mockingbird entirely misses Harper Lee's point, uh, that this is exactly the kind of bigot that Atticus has been all along. There's no contradiction between Atticus defending an innocent black man accused of rape and Mockingbird, and Atticus mistrusting civil rights 20 years later. Both are part of a paternal effort to help a minority that, in this view, cannot yet entirely help itself. So, I mean, did this, mm -hmm. did the book um, shed any kind of like retroactive light or darkness on uh, To Kill a Mockingbird mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because Atticus, you could always go back and look at his character. And I think there's been some scholarship that's done this, um, look selectively at Mockingbird or look at it with a more sort of nuanced gaze and say, yeah, this is someone who was assigned to defend an innocent man and did it to the best of his ability because he's a lawyer. I'm not sure why we're giving him a cookie and a statue in the town square for that. Um, that's certainly a justifiable viewpoint to take. And Ghost at a Watchman is not so much dedicated to transforming Atticus as it is to transforming Scout and showing her maturation. Um, I do think that the thematic differences between the two books are less, um, are more about um, growing up and sort of taking down your idols than they are about um, whether goodness is actually possible in the world or something. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that uh, one, one review I read, maybe it was the Gothic also, um, made this unusual point that without To Kill a Mockingbird, he, he thought, or whoever wrote this piece thought, uh, Ghost of Watchmen doesn't make sense because yeah. the, without having the Atticus that we knew before, the, right. the, 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 there's no like central, there's no like shock of- There's no big the, reveal. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, this character that I haven't spent a novel learning to love uh, turns out to be a jerk. There are many jerky characters in literature. Yeah, yeah I mean, what, what do you um, think of that? And do you think that maybe shed some light on possibly that they're not telling the truth about how this, the real order of, of these books or, or, or I mean, what, what do you think? Like, what, do you think that that, that goes out of Watchmen would make sense to people? if To Kill a Mockingbird didn't exist? So I don't think that people would pay attention um, to Ghost at a Watchmen, especially in the way that they are now, if Mockingbird didn't exist, just because it's it's not quite the caliber work. I think a lot of reviewers have agreed on that. Um, 
but so so the question is um do i think that it came that was that it was actually written after i i was struck by adam gopnik gopnik's ar argument but i I also think that this seems like the work of a less practiced writer than the author of Mockingbird. And uh -huh. so I am persuaded by the notion that she started with this and just revised it and revised it. And there are actually passages that recur almost verbatim um, here and in To Kill Mockingbird. So I, I imagine that if To Kill Mockingbird had already been published, she wouldn't feel as confident airlifting those quotes. Um, but I think, I mean, it's clearly these are characters that have been alive in Harper Lee's head for a very long time. And perhaps when she wrote her first draft, which was Watchmen, she hadn't done enough to persuade us that it mattered um, that Atticus is not who she thought he was. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Um, so I mean, yeah, I'm inclined to accept the timeline that's been given. Okay. Uh, but, but you still think that if, if to, to, to you know, if this had this novel had originally been published in 1959 or whatever, like it probably would have just passed by and it maybe would have even made a ton of sense to people. Yeah, I mean, I just there are beautiful moments in it. Um, there are there's lots of I mean, her humor, as I said, she has this kind of gently puncturing, um, compassionate but acidic. Um, sense of humor and it's delightful. Her evocations of place are vivid and wonderful. I think someone might have read the book and thought, wow, there are real shimmers of mastery here and I can't wait to see what she does next. But uh -huh. especially as the book goes on, it kind of devolves into these long discursive conversations between two characters. It seems very academic. Um, it's a little bit meandery. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think that she would have broken out onto the scene with the same sort of uh, inevitable star power uh -huh. if she had started with this book. Right. Um, one more thing before we close out. Could you talk about um, how the character of Cal Calpurnia is portrayed in Ghost Out of Watchmen? That seems like a very interesting and, and powerful. Yeah, part. that's a great question. This was actually, this was one of those flashes of brilliance. So um, Jean Louise, formerly Scout, goes back to visit her old maid, who's a Black woman named Calpurnia. And um, in Mockingbird, Cal is just this loving, warm, um, wise presence. And um, there's no real distance between her and the Finch family. And yeah. it's it's a very beautiful portrayal of, of a bond um, between Act, you know, blacks and whites, and it's kind of an idealistic, maybe romanticized portrayal. But right. here, uh, Scout goes back to visit Cal, who's retired, and there is this kind of remoteness or alienness to their interaction where Scout is trying to get at Cal Calpurnian's uh, true emotion, and Calpurnia is putting up a front and seems very distanced from this white woman on her doorstep. And it's devastating. It's devastating to be in Scout's head as she sees this happening um, and to feel the loss of intimacy um, and also the loss of this kind of racial harmony um, that Scout experienced as a kid and, and, and experienced as a sort of broader possibility for social relationships, not just something between her and Cal. Uh -huh. um, and so I think that is one of those moments where instead of like this long conversation between her and an uncle, you can see her disillusionment happening um, as opposed to like seeing it or as opposed to being told that it's happening. Um, and it's, it's very persuasive and, and sad. Mm -hmm. um, so a uh, final question would be, uh, would you recommend this book to the average reader who read To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, in, in ninth grade? And remembers it finally. That's a tough one. I I would just because you know there are there are pleasures that you can get from Harper Lee that you can't get anywhere else, and also because it's really fascinating literary artifact. Just a first draft of one of your favorite books of all time. If if you know you loved Mockingbird, like who wouldn't want to read that? I don't think that this book detracts from um, 
from Mockingbird. I think it's just kind of a thought experiment that exists alongside it. And so I would recommend it for anyone who has time. If you're only going to read like five books this year, there are other things. But if you have time, go for it, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay, so actually- How's that uh, for walking the line? <laughs> I, I, I'll ask one more follow-up question to that, which is uh, what, name another book that came out recently that you would, you would recommend people read if they have limited time. Oh man. And before they read, uh, go set a watchman. Oh gosh. Do, can I say things that haven't come out yet or does it, or should it have come out already? Uh, you, uh, you can pick, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe something that's coming out so our readers could go, you know, run to the bookstore right now and, uh, and pick it up. Okay. I've got a few. Um, one that recently came out, um, the sunlit night by Rebecca Dennerstein. Um, she is also a Yale grad, so I'm not sure if you if you know her, um, but she was a few years ahead of me. She's a beautiful writer. She has this lyrical, pensive, um, gently funny um, tone. She writes about light beautifully because this is taking place at the top of the world in, in Norway. Um, it's a great book. Definitely go read it. Mm -hmm. um, something that has not come out yet, but which I just finished and am innerly, or, yeah, inwardly cavelling about so such that I can't actually speak English anymore, apparently, um, is The Beautiful Bureaucrat um, by Helen Phillips, I think. Um, the Beautiful Bureaucrat, look it up. It's fabulous. It's like this fable taking place in a dystopic world. Um, and it's, it's just great. So those are my two recommendations for now. I have more though, if you have more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're probably about at the end of our time, um, but uh, thank you so much, Katie Waldman, for coming back on Culturally Determined and uh, talking about Ghost of the Watchmen. And uh, hopefully- Yeah, it's always so fun. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to have you on again uh, sometime in the future. Great, well, thanks so much. It was um, a pleasure and have a great day. Okay, you too, thanks, bye. All right, bye.